from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Activision Blizzard employees taking a stand, staging a walkout to press CEO Bobby Kotick to step down. This after a report he was aware for years of sexual misconduct claims, including allegations of rape at an Activision studio. We will bring you the very latest. Plus, it has been an uphill climb for Peloton. Shares jumping after a $1 billion stock offering brings in major investors. Will this take the connected fitness company over the hump after its grim forecast for bike sales and signups? We'll discuss. And Roblox shares on the rise after four days in a row, including its investor day today. Our exclusive interview with CEO David Bazuki about paving new ways to play games into the metaverse later this hour. We'll get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta and stocks getting a lift from solid economic data out today. Kriti, take it away. Well, Emily, the green on the screen in the markets is really where it ended up. But the question is, is the consumer spending? And we got that answer really loud and clear today. And it is. Retail data actually showing that spending is actually higher month over month. And on top of that, blowout earnings from Home Depot and Walmart really signaling that fiscal stimulus, that monetary support. Well, it's not gone yet. And it showed up in the stock market. The S&P 500 up 0.4%. But you still saw that tech outperformance, saw that defensive bit, ultimately closing with tech as one of the best performers. Tesla, of course, leading the way higher but risk sentiment and a little sour today and you can really see that in the Bloomberg Galaxy crypto index down seven percent you saw Bitcoin especially retreating from those record highs I want to show you a micro story though that really caught my eye and that of course is Rivian a 15 percent intraday gain actually boosting its market cap to pass some of its major competitors BYD and Volkswagen it is now competing inching its way higher to Toyota's market cap in particular and remember Emily this IB IPO excuse me debuted just last week so a really an eye-watering rally let's get to some of those other top tech movers I want to hit it off with Peloton because they actually issued a one billion dollar stock offering to raise more money you know they've been having that cash crunch and instead of actually dropping the eight percent pre-market that's really where the stock started it actually gained because they got lots of demand not only raising one billion dollars that it was supposed to but an extra million on top that really saying that investors were wanting those those shares so you see those shares soaring 15 percent Qualcomm as well putting out some pretty good earnings and upbeat forecasts but most importantly partnering with BMW for to supply chips for their autonomous vehicle as well so good news for that company in particular up almost eight percent but on the downside Emily Activision still dealing with those sexual misconduct stories the, the Wall Street Journal reporting that the CEO actually knew about what was going on with his within the company and then the employees staging a walked out until he supported it the board of course supporting uh, Activision CEO but it's that that uh, kind of tug of war that's really weighing on the shares today, Emily. All right, Kriti, I want to continue on that Activision story. You just mentioned workers at the company staging a walkout, uh, pushing for CEO Bobby Kotick to step down after these multiple allegations for more. I want to bring in our Bloomberg Tech reporter, Jason Schreier, who covers gaming and has been closely following all the developments here. Jason, the revelations from this Wall Street Journal story are incredibly alarming. Walk us through the new information here and what Bobby Kotick supposedly knew and did not know. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Emily. So the report was really explosive. It was a bombshell. It uh, alleged that Bobby Kotick knew about all sorts of things that he uh, was looped in on an email, um, on an, uh, a report of a rape by an employee of Sledgehammer, which is a studio that makes Call of Duty games. Um, it just detailed all sorts of uh, instances where he was looped in and essentially painted a picture of him as a CEO who was very hands-on, in control of all communications and matters at the company. So he absolutely knew. The Wall Street Journal also reported that he is the perpetrator of some of these instances, um, telling, telling some stories about him uh, dealing with assistants in ways that they found uncomfortable. Um, one assistant said that he left her a voicemail essentially threatening her, threatening her life, which he and the company claimed was hyperbolic and jokey. Um, but the picture that the Wall Street Journal paints is not pretty for Bobby Kotick. 
Activision has called the reporting inaccurate and misleading. They say they're committed to being an inclusive company. And, and the board standing behind Bobby Kotick, saying that they believe he's appropriately addressed these issues brought to his attention. You know, what's the likelihood that he can survive this, given the direct pressure now being put on him by his own employees? Yeah, you know, it's so it's 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 a strange thing. Bobby Kotick uh, is the longest running CEO in the video game industry. He has been running Activision since I believe 1990, and he has made a lot, a lot, a lot of money for that board of directors, for shareholders. Um, he has just pumped up that stock through the roof. Um, <clears throat> obviously lost some gains um, recently since the lawsuit hit this summer, but it seems like the board has faith in him to keep it going. I, at the beginning of today, when I saw that Wall Street Journal story, I honestly thought he would be gone by the end of the day. So I was a little, mm -hmm. little surprised to see the board standing by him because it feels like he's just completely lost the faith of his employees. Right now, as we speak, about 150 people are marching or are, are kind of protesting in Irvine, California, where Blizzard's office is. Blizzard is a subsidiary of Activision Blizzard, um, and they are calling for his immediate uh, ousting. Um, even more people are protesting virtually as part of this walkout. So um, it, it feels like he's lost the confidence of his staff. So I'm actually pretty surprised that the board, board is saying they stand by him. All right, Jason Trier, thank you so much for your reporting on the story. We'll continue to follow how all of this plays out. Uh, definitely very shocking revelations in that Wall Street Journal report. Now, if you were trying to listen to music on Spotify or get ahead on holiday shopping with Etsy or Target, a massive cloud outage might have slowed you down. Multiple major company websites from Home Depot to Snapchat were down or having issues Tuesday afternoon, first indicated on the outage tractor down detector. User reports spiked just after noon Eastern. In an incident report published on Google's cloud dashboard, the company confirmed it had suffered a global outage and stated they were working to resolve the issues. Google said some problems were caused by bad network configuration and that they will publish an analysis of the incident once an internal investigation is completed. Coming up, how Slack is adapting its platform to meet the needs of an increasingly digital work environment. We're going to speak with Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield following day one of its Frontiers conference next. This is Bloomberg. Back to the very early days of Slack, we came up with this mission to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant, and more productive. And part of that ambition was always finding a new avenue to bring software and systems and tools that people use into the environment where the discussions are happening and the decisions are being made. Eight years after launch, the messaging platform Slack is now one of the leaders in business communication. And as whole companies now shift to remote work, businesses across industries have realized the need to digitize their operations. Let's talk about how Slack is adapting with these changing trends. Joining me now, Slack CEO and co-founder, Stuart Butterfield. Stuart, great to have you back with us. You just kicked off your Frontiers Conference today to talk about the future of work and more connected experiences. How is Slack stepping up to make these experiences even more seamless and real? What a great setup. Thank you, and, and uh, great to be here. Uh, I think there's there's two tracks, so two significant um, announcements. And one is, you know, maybe five or six years in the making, this culmination of a vision we had to give people building blocks that they could easily assemble and reassemble to build workflows that allow them to deal with uh, hundreds or, in some cases, uh, thousand plus tools in use at an average large enterprise. I'll come back to that a, a little bit later, but the other one is, is much newer and fresher and developed in response to what we saw from customers, what we saw in ourselves during the pandemic. And that's things like huddles, which launched in July. It's like audio only, not quite a call, but more of a call replacement. Um, Clips, which is for asynchronous video meetings, so people can free up some time on their calendar. And it's a uh, it's really, you know, honestly, it's an exciting environment because there's a lot going on and, and uh, you really see customers and organizations digging into the challenges. 
Now, one of the things you're doing is you're working to give more non-technical users the ability to customize their Slack experience. I recently spoke to the CEO of Airtable. You know, they're also working on these no-code, no low-code applications to give uh, users the abilities to build their own apps, even if they don't know how to code. Take a listen to what Howie Lou said about the future of work and how it is shifting uh, and why we need these kinds of experiences. In the old way of working, you, know, you could kind of get away with ad hoc uh, ways of tracking data, of sharing data. You would meet with people, send emails back and forth, um, tap people on the shoulder. And I think today when you have all these people distributed in different places, that just doesn't scale anymore. How game changing do you think your new suite of products can be in this post pandemic environment? Well, I think they're you know more valuable this year than they would have been last, and they'll be more valuable still in the future. Because let me make that a little bit more concrete. And of course, I, I agree with Howie and uh, Slack and Airtable have a great integration. But imagine you're a recruiter, and it's a typical day. You send out an offer letter to a candidate. Good news, they sign it. So you get an email from DocuSign, and now you've memorized like all these steps. You're going to go to the applicant tracking system where you record all the jobs that are open and flip that one off turn the job listing on the website off. You're going to go put to the HR system and say that this person has a start date. You're going to go tell the hiring manager. And it's really allowing people like that recruiter or people in benefits administration, legal, finance, sales, to kind of pull those things together and automate a lot of that work. So that when the notification comes in from DocuSign, the update of the applicant tracking system and the HR system are all automatic or as close to automatic as you can make it. And the idea here is that the people who are doing this work have a much better idea of the workflows that are going to reduce friction and simplify their lives uh, compared to the professional software developers who are building the tools. So ideally, there's like a collaboration between the non-technical end users and the people making the software. Now, while more people are working remotely, not everyone is. Some are hybrid, some are in the office full time. You know. How do you minimize that friction? You know, and I know you're, you're obviously adopting this in your own workforce. What are the risks of this new work world? Well, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say because the pandemic is, is like such a, a once in a lifetime event. And I think we've made some permanent shifts and permanent changes and there's been a little bit of a revolution in work. But obviously at some point, the actual threat of the disease kind of mitigates and we learn to live with the risks. People want to be able to get together, but I don't think you're going to get workers to give up the autonomy and flexibility that they received over the last couple of years, because you know even let's say two days in the office isn't a 60% reduction. You know you don't have to go for three days. For most people, it's an infinite increase because they're going in zero days now, um, and it, this power dynamic has definitely shifted towards the um, labor side to sort of the employees from the employers, and that's happening you know across all these industries. So I don't think it's going to be up to the leaders necessarily to dictate that people have to come into the office. The good news for them is you get to select from a much bigger talent pool, you know, people all over the world. I don't think we've stopped, talked, Stuart, since the Salesforce deal closed, and Salesforce has been talking about a digital HQ. What will Slack's role be in this? Well, I we like to think of it as the place where everything comes together. And there's this interesting thing. So, uh, I'll put myself in this, this category as well. Historically, we've thought a lot more about real estate leases and conference room design and office buildouts and seating charts and, and all that kind of stuff. Relatively little attention to the digital infrastructure that supports productivity and collaboration. But imagine some alternate universe where in March 2020, we were all allowed to go into the office. Uh, but all of the software that we used to, to communicate was taken away, we would cease to exist. You know, like companies that have done really well over the last couple of years just would disintegrate in 48 or 72 hours. So we've obviously switched the relative importance. It's not the digital supplementing in person. It's the other way around. And it has been for, for many years. And it's time for leaders to start paying more attention to that digital infrastructure and thinking about you know, being thoughtful about the design and investing in employees' ability to communicate, doing more training, all of that kind of stuff. Now that you've been at this hybrid slash remote mode for you know a year and a half, what have you learned about yourself and how you work that's surprised you? Well, you know, again, it's hard to separate the pandemic part, but it's been a it's been a really interesting experience. So we were talking about this earlier, but I have a, a six month old now, 
so obviously born during the pandemic. And I went on on leave. And you know, before going on leave, I was at home most of the, you know, more or less every day. Um, I got to spend uh, a couple months um, really deep in the experience with my son. But when I went back to work, I was still just at home. Um, and so I could spend an hour with him in the morning, you know, I walk out of a meeting on a little break, I could go see him. It's very different than the experience of like, I got to catch the 613 train to make sure I get home before the kids go to bed. And uh, that's just one example of the kind of thing that it's not, it's not gonna be easy for people to give that up. Right. And something you didn't know you, you would miss, right? Um, got to yeah. ask you about the metaverse. What's, what's your view on the metaverse? And what will Slack's role be in it? Are you bullish? Um, this might be one of those things where I feel like I'm getting old because I don't know. I don't mean that I'm against it, um, but it, the applications are a little bit hard for me to imagine. Um, and just like the, the physical setup of having a headset on, perhaps when the technology is a little bit more advanced. Now, having said that, I think there's a lot of applications that aren't really so much about knowledge work, but if you're you know, you work at Boeing and you're wiring an airplane, uh, augmented reality would be a huge uh, boon. Same thing in fulfillment centers and factories and, and things like that. Um, and Slack was one of the partners in the, in the metaverse launch. Ideally, we see something that's less, you know, in the mode of people typing at their keyboards and, and sending messages that are principally text and more about the button press, the acknowledgement, the investigation, the notifications coming in and giving people an easier way to deal with it. That might be one of the most honest answers I've heard yet about the metaverse, Stuart. There's a lot that we just still don't know. Thank you yeah. for acknowledging that. Slack CEO and co-founder Stuart Butterfield, great to have you back here on the show. Thanks for stopping by. Okay, coming up, online wholesale marketplace Fair says its goal is to help mom and pop shops keep up with Amazon. We're going to introduce you to the company making a bet on the rise of independent retail around the world. And it's now valued at almost $12.5 billion. And on our way to the metaverse, how big an opportunity is augmented reality glasses? Qualcomm president and CEO Cristiano Mon seems to think it could be even bigger than smartphones. Take a listen. The reason we're very bullish on this, we believe that when you look at your phone today, the screen is really the limiting factor. There's so much more that you can do, but you're limited by the screen. And I can see a future when everybody will have a companion glasses that you're gonna wear, your smart glasses next to your smartphone. This opportunity could be as big as the smartphone itself. The online wholesale marketplace Fair just hit a $12.4 billion valuation. This after closing $400 million in a new investment round. Fair is all about putting power in the hands of independent retailers, helping mom and pop shops take on e-commerce giants like Amazon. Let's talk about what the future holds and how the supply chain crunch is impacting their plans with Fair CFO Lauren Cooks Levitin. Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. So, how do you give that power back to mom and pop shops and help them challenge Amazon? Well, thanks for inviting me, Emily. The main way we do that is by giving them technology tools that historically have only been available to much larger businesses. So, we give them the opportunity to shop on a machine learning based uh, assortment. So the recommendations that they're getting, we're pretty confident those products are going to sell in their stores. And then we give them other tools that are typically only available to much larger businesses like net 60 payment terms and the ability to return goods when they're not selling in their stores. So uh, all of that is something that you know, historically has not been an opportunity for smaller businesses. And we know they can compete when we can level the playing field for them. So how are these supply chain challenges impacting these smaller businesses and entrepreneurs? How are they keeping their, their shelves stocked, especially going into the holidays? So we're a two-sided marketplace. On one side, our supply are 40,000 brands in 80 countries. And then the demand side is over 300,000 retailers in North America and now in 15 countries in Europe. And they're facing different challenges associated with the supply chain uh, traffic jam. On the brand side, they're trying to get components. 
but they're also able to communicate with retailers about what they have available and in stock and on quick ship. And that's something that retailers really appreciate. They can come to fair and they can find out what's available. They can shop based on their values, including made in the USA, that oftentimes used to be something that was important to them for the origin of the business, but now they're also using a shorthand for things that they think they're gonna be able to get into their stores more quickly and accommodate their customers. Interestingly enough, we know that consumers wanna shop with their local retailers. They feel really confident they're gonna pick products that uh, resonate with them, but they also feel more confident that they can move more quickly and adapt to the changes and they can find small goods with 40,000 brands to choose from, they can fill okay. a void in their inventory very quickly by coming on FAIR. $400 million in new funding. How do you plan to use it? Well, there's really three primary areas. The first is to continue expanding both in more categories and more geographies. I mentioned we entered Europe over the last six months. have been really uh, excited by the progress we're seeing there. We are over $150 million run rate. That's took us three years to get to that level in, in North America, and we did that in six months. So we'll continue emphasizing that growth. Second, we'll continue building tools that support both our retailers and our brands to, uh, to again, level that playing field. And then third, we'll continue building out our team. We'll end this year at about 800 employees and expect to double that next year as we work on all the ways that we can support the brands and retailers to, to chase their dreams. Almost $12.5 billion, that's a pretty big valuation. What are your plans to go public? Well, right now we're really focused entirely on supporting the brands and retailers that are our customer base. If it turns out that uh, you know being a public company would be in service of achieving those dreams, it's something that we would consider. But right now uh, we felt like this public, this private financing was the right step. And I know you're really passionate about women entrepreneurs, women owned businesses quickly. How are women business owners faring post-pandemic? Well, we read so much about uh, the, the how this has been a, a female uh, recession and, a, and, and, and that women were really disproportionately impacted. One of the things that's so beautiful about FAIR is uh, we provide working capital tools for all businesses, small businesses, and many times those are underrepresented minorities and women. And what we've seen from both our brands who continue to grow and continue to come to FAIR, now over 40,000 of them, and from our retailers who also continue to grow and succeed okay. and drive more volume on our platform, we see them succeeding. And it's something that all, right. our, all of our employees are really proud of um, being able to support. CFO of FAIR, Lauren Cooks Levitin, thank you for joining Thanks, us. Emily. Coming up, while expectations were low, heading into the first face to face summit between Presidents Biden and Xi Jinping, the virtual meeting appears to be a political success, at least on its face. We're going to head to Hong Kong for all those details. And later, I will be speaking with Roblox CEO David Bazuki in an exclusive interview covering some of their new announcements from their investor conference and their push into the metaverse next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's head back to New York where Kriti Gupta has been taking a look at the markets. Kriti, what are you watching now? Well, Emily, in honor of uh, President Biden and President Xi having a virtual meeting, I thought we'll take a walk down memory lane, in particular of the trade war back in 2018 when you did have a lot of those spats actively reflect on the U.S. stock market. You see the orange line is essentially the stocks in the Russell 1000 that had a lot more exposure to China. The white line is the Russell 1000. You can really see the underperformance if you were exposed to China. But that has seemed to, that gap has seemed to close now, really telling you that that trade war impact that was so strong four years ago, well, it's faded a little bit. But another place I really want to look for that impact is in the semiconductor space because a lot of American companies are dependent on semis and a lot of those chip makers have supply chains that extend all the way back into Asia. But this year, Emily, they've been soaring and it has a lot to do with that global chip shortage, but it also has a lot to do with this active understanding that you need chips for things like EVs. You need chips for things like smartphones. So essentially that time lag and the 
idea that the president of uh, Biden's administration is actively willing to invest in that infrastructure, you can see just how big the gains are. 131% when it comes to NVIDIA, and the gains only get to somewhere in the 80s, somewhere in the 30s. That is not bad compared to the S&P 500 year-to-date performance. I want to end with Chinese tech versus uh, U.S. tech because that is a divergence that's far more clear and has less to do with the trade war and more with Chinese regulatory scrutiny, especially in the last two years. You can see that gap has widened quite a bit and continues to widen as you start to see more restrictions on what these Chinese tech companies can and cannot do. And where what is that doing to U.S. tech? Well, it's rerouting funds to U.S. tech. And you can see that in that white line really outperforming the Golden Dragon Index, uh, which, of course, holds those U.S.-listed Chinese ADRs, Emily. All right. Kriti, thanks for that. Meantime, as Kriti mentioned, U.S. President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping attempting to stabilize what has been a tense relationship between the world's two largest economies. They agreed to keep on talking without letting disagreements over Taiwan and other issues derail U.S.-China engagement. The virtual summit lasted more than three hours, longer than expected. Bloomberg's Stephen Engel joins us now with more. So, Stephen, give us the big headlines. Well, we got confirmation from National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan that Taiwan really did uh, play a large part of those three and a half hours of discussions. And for the most part, uh, from both sides, uh, you're reading the comments from state media and reading the readout from the White House, it seems like the engagement was quite positive and as China's been trying to, you know, return the relationship to a, a, a higher track and a better track, a more uh, productive track for the two uh, world's largest economies, of course. Uh, but Taiwan is a, is a flashpoint and a sticking point, and there's a new development on that front. Of course, t Taiwan being the critical cog, of course, in the global supply chain for tech, uh, it is critical to know, kind of track its future. And, you know, Xi Jinping wanted clarity from Biden administration on, uh, you know, does Biden support the one China policy? Does it support the status quo? And essentially, Biden told Xi that, yes, we support uh, the, the one China policy and, uh, you know, the, he does not support uh, de uh, independence. That's the bottom line. And even state media in China said Biden opposes independence for Taiwan. Well, let's fast forward a few hours to just a couple of hours ago. Biden, on his way to New Hampshire, uh, said, on the one hand, he supports the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, but at the same time, he said, quote, Taiwan is independent. It makes its own decisions. Now, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know if Biden was stepping in it again and miss speaking, uh, I think he was essentially saying, well, well Taiwan is, you know, it, it, it governs itself. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's independent. So this is going to reopen the wound a little bit, rip off the Band-Aid from yesterday. Uh, what does Biden actually mean about Taiwan? Indeed. Well, what does this actually mean about the future of the U.S.-China relationship? It has been incredibly frosty. That, of course, started under President Trump. But it's a policy that President Biden has seemingly continued. Well, it's understandable to, to a certain degree why Biden would not uh, remove the tariffs uh, or, or the specter of this this trade war, uh, because then you're removing all that leverage in the first year of office. So I'm sure there are inclinations to remove the tariffs. I mean, it's caused uh, anecdotally and also by the numbers some inflation in the United States. We all know inflation is a big problem right now uh, being dealt with by the Fed. But Again, if you take away those tariffs, uh, you immediately remove a big lever of leverage uh, with the China relationship at a time when it was at a, at, at a nadir, really, and, and rebuilding under a Biden vision of China rather than the Trump vision. So it's going to take time. It's still the first year of the Biden administration, and they're still trying to work out what works with Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is the strongest Chinese leader now uh, we've had since Mao Zedong. So it's a different dynamic. Supply chain issues not going away. China is a critical part of that. How important is it to keep the peace, especially right now and six weeks, you know, through the holidays? Well, absolutely. I mean, look, 
there there is a bifurcation going on in in the tech world and supply chains and you know China looking a little bit more inward and trying to be more self-sufficient uh, for chips to other high-tech products uh, so they're looking at the at the domestic economy but of course the United States uh, needs that uh, those imports from China and Taiwan as well and where the supply chain is crimped uh, but there's an interesting story on the Bloomberg terminal this morning I don't have time here to get into it but it's a <laughs> lengthy piece I encourage all of our our viewers to, to read it about this new division uh, in China called Xinchuang and it is a, it's, it's basically government backed and it is solely with the purpose of identifying suppliers in China who can supply China's high-tech ambitions they're going to be vetting and you know adding input from the government's perspective on hiring and the products that need to be made in China by Chinese companies so they're less reliant on US suppliers all right, you can check that story out on the Bloomberg Terminal or at Bloomberg.com. Stephen Engel, always appreciate your view from Hong Kong. Thank you for joining us. Meantime, Amazon has decided not to go ahead with a major office expansion in Jersey City. That's a blow for landlord Matt Cali Realty. Earlier this month, Bloomberg reported Amazon had been close to a lease with Matt Cali for roughly 400,000 square feet on the New Jersey waterfront. Bloomberg has learned the deal fell apart after Amazon backed out last minute. Coming up, shares of Peloton moving higher after saying it'll sell about $1 billion of stock. Could this be the U-turn the connected fitness company needs to keep the post-pandemic momentum going? We'll discuss next. This is Bloomberg. Shares of Peloton rising, the maker of connected bikes and treadmills saying it'll sell a billion dollars worth of stock. Shares have fallen 45% since Peloton slashed its annual revenue forecast by as much as a billion dollars. Earlier this month, our own Mark Gurman joins us now with more. So, Mark, what exactly does this share offering mean? So this means that there is now a secondary market of shares that Peloton is selling to investors to really build up more capital. And they expect to build up more than a billion dollars in capital here. Their share price is in the mid $50 per range now after falling by nearly half. Uh, the share price that they're going to be selling these additional shares at come in at about $46 a share, I believe, somewhere in the mid 40s. So that's quite a bit of savings there in order to raise that over billion dollars in capital. And we sort of see how to get your stock out of a funk. Will you do a move like this? Is it going to work or do they have to get the numbers to back it up? Well, the shares, you know, went up uh, today, but they closed up 16 percent from yesterday. So it did work at least uh, from today, people being able to come in at that much lower price. This is the first time since the IPO a few years ago that Peloton obviously did a major public offering like this. They say they will be profitable again by fiscal 2023, but investors are really going to want to see that happen before they really continue to invest heavily in that stock uh, beyond this initial one billion dollar raise. Walk us through the challenges that Peloton is facing, their grim forecast, and what you're going to be looking for through the holiday season. Well, the, this is really self-inflicted wounds in, in one respect. One is they should not have guided. They should have not have provided those forecasts. Only three months ago, they said they would be making a billion dollars more than they're actually going to in fiscal 2022. But that doesn't affect, that doesn't really impact the overall business. The numbers really be the same. We just wouldn't know about the forecasts. They clearly uh, are anticipating stronger results coming out of COVID uh, than they're going to have. They see people going back to the gym. They see people going back to the offices. So they're really going to continue to have to invest in their marketing and other strategies and other types of new categories of products to get people hooked on uh, to Peloton in order to get back to those levels of profitability. Early next year, they're going to be releasing the Peloton Guide. Uh, this is going to be a product that comes in at less than half the price of their bike. This is a home strength training device, so that's going to be a key way to add more people to the ecosystem. As they get more people on both connected and digital subscriptions, I think they do have a compelling case to make. Even though you know COVID is nearing the end in terms of economic reopenings, there still probably is a place for people working out at home. People have bought in treadmills and other devices for home for many years, and Peloton really wants to be the king of that. What's the main competition here? Is it other bike and tread makers, or is it the gym, or is it coming out of a pandemic and everyone not being on lockdown? 
I think it's a, a mix of the three, right? Tonal is their big competitor now in strength training. The Tonal makes a very similar device, albeit four to five times more expensive than the, the Peloton Guide. I think it's the lower end treadmills that people are buying for a few hundred bucks on Amazon that are a big competitor right there. Uh, I also think you know the complications from COVID, a combination of the misestimation of demand, uh, underperforming supply chain. I think these are all red flags that have basically torn apart the, the Peloton story for the next few quarters. So what's next? What are you watching? Yeah, obviously the Peloton Guide uh, coming out in early 2022. We'll want to see reception to that. We'll want to see how that product integrates with their other devices. Uh, there are also other products in the pipeline. There's a rowing machine they have been working on. I want to see them find a way to get the treadmill, come out with a treadmill that's even less expensive. Right now the treadmill's at $2,500. If they can get that down by another you know, $1,000, that could be a really nice sweet spot for people. An even lower end bike that comes in at under $1,000. And I think marketing their financing plans where they're advertising their different products at a monthly rate instead of the full purchase price a stronger push into that, perhaps some sort of partnership with a, a dedicated credit card of some sort to get people hooked onto Peloton, really hooking people onto the subscription and making it so there's lower churn. I think all of those things combined could be pretty compelling for the company. In addition to, to wearables, they're coming out with their first arm-worn wearable, this heart rate monitor that connects to the Peloton Guide. It's also going to be available for their other products. Eventually turning that into a completely standalone device similar to a Whoop or an Amazon Halo could be fairly compelling as well. And there's also a whole ecosystem of accessories for the fitness market that they can get hooked onto. Also the pre-core acquisition, a commercial position for them to get into existing gyms, existing hotels, college campuses, getting the Peloton outside of the home is a very potential strong area for them. And that really alleviates the concerns around you know, do people really want to work out at home versus not? If Peloton's at home, if Peloton's in your gym, it doesn't really matter to the company. They're still selling that equipment and drumming up their bottom line. All right, Mark Gurman, thank you for sharing all of that with us. Lots to watch out for. Appreciate it. Coming up, I'm going to be speaking with Roblox CEO David Bazuki in an exclusive interview you don't want to miss from the future of gaming to the metaverse and beyond. All that coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Roblox on a roll, passing Activision as the world's most valuable gaming company in shares, hitting a record high as the company kicked off its investors conference. With us now, Roblox CEO David Bazuki here for an exclusive interview. So obviously, huge day for you, David. What are the key takeaways for investors today about where Roblox is going? Emily, thank you for having us on the show, reaching out to our community and our shareholders, of course. We talked a lot today about innovation. We had over 21 executives, I believe, from the company sharing different areas of our product stack. We talked a lot about a foundation of safety and civility running throughout really the whole company and everything we do. We talked about our amazing community that powers everything on Roblox, everything, the millions of experiences all built by this amazing community. Now, Roblox just overtook Activision as the world's most valuable gaming company, are we seeing a changing of the guard here in terms of the kinds of games people want to play now and into the future? We, we shared a vision today of this future category, sometimes called the metaverse. We think of it as a human co-experience category that supports people coming together to socialize, to learn, to play, someday to work, to experience entertainment and amazing brands. So we don't usually think of ourselves as a video game company. That said, our millions of creators make amazing games and experiences on the platform that um, sometimes are games and sometimes are music concerts. So I don't know if it's as much changing as the guard as maybe the emergence of a new category. How far away is this metaverse actually and how is Roblox going to get us there? Yeah, the, this, this term has really been in the genre of futurists, sci-fi writers, authors. We've, there's been a dialogue around this over the last 30 to 40 years. 
And we're, we're actually in the middle of it right now. There's over um, 200 million roughly monthly people on the Roblox platform every month. They do a lot of things. They have an identity, they have an avatar, they do stuff together. Sometimes when they can't be together in person, they'll go to a birthday party together or graduate from high school together. So we're actually in the middle of it. But it's such an amazing, big, new potential category that there's a lot of opportunity ahead as well. Facebook just changed its name to Meta and seems to want to own the metaverse. Will they? Will any one company own this new world? Yeah, we're, we're really, really, I think, early in this, this amazing opportunity. I, I think it's going to change the way people both communicate, the way we share stories. I think, ultimately, it's going to allow people to learn together in interesting new ways. Um, as more people are working remotely, it's going to power that as well. We're, we're very optimistic about a really big civil society emerging on these uh, types of platforms. But we think we're still actually really early. There's a key word you just said there, and that is civil. Facebook's own CTO has warned about harassment as an existential threat in this new world. And of course, there's a concern that you know, the worst of society could get replicated in this new world. You were really early to this in the thinking about this. How, what have you learned about creating norms and healthy behavior in the metaverse and making sure that other companies do the same? It's super important. Within a month of launching Roblox over 16 years ago, my co-founder Eric and I, we built our first civil, civil and safety system and we manned the moderation queues. Now it's really our top priority. We have thousands of people 24 seven um, keeping Roblox civil and safe. We build it into everything we do. We have an amazing uh, group of creative people on the platform, many of them young. And we're, we're very proud of how much we've worked to make this a place where people can come together to be with their friends, to do things. It's the foundation of our company, and we really have no tolerance for things like bullying, for example. You see big potential for education in the metaverse, and I know you're trying to get 100 million students engaged there by 2030. Can you give me some examples? Like, does this mean we can visit foreign countries or you know, landmarks on the other side of the world with, without having to, to, to look at them yeah. and read about them online? Well, in addition to the millions of people that are learning computer science, for example, on Roblox, there's also this vision that side by side with books and side by side with video, as you mentioned, if we wanted to go to ancient Rome, uh, we might actually go there together in our class, experience it, interact with um, the environment and actually see what it's like. So we think there's three pillars of education, computer science, co-experience. But we're also optimistic uh, even further off in the future for some people that don't have access to education. They may be able to use these 3D type platforms to join a class, dissect a frog, even when they're not near that school. Now, you've been expanding in China, but you're coming up against the government crackdown there on gaming. How is that impacting you, and are you reconsidering any of your plans? We have a super long-term view in China. We think this type of technology is going to really uh, connect people all around the world. We're very conservative financially with you know, our forecast. We don't roll China into that. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, it is a changing political landscape. But we take the long view in everything we do, as well as respect our community. And we continue to take the long view in China. Roblox had a widespread server outage a couple of weeks ago. I believe you know you were down for three days, and I'm sure those were three long days for you. What lessons did you take from that as you scale and grow? Would you consider partnering with an AWS or a Microsoft one day to, to use their cloud capabilities? Yeah, so we took this very seriously, and you're, you're exactly right. This was three long days. We're going to publish an analysis of what happened and share what we're doing to make sure this never happens again. Uh, we were really surprised by the outpouring of our community and support. And when, when that outage, when we came back up, we didn't lose any of the people on the platform, which was very gratifying. But it highlighted the responsibility we have with our community to be a 24-7 utility, really, for them. So um, we'll share more about that in the future. We took it very seriously. 
Adopt Me is now the most popular game on Roblox, I believe. Uh, you can raise virtual pets there. I think my kids use this. Um, 64 million players every month. What are your favorite games on Roblox, Dave? Oh, this is really fun. It's almost like asking me who, which is my favorite child, right? <laughs> Except that I would have millions and millions of children. And all of these are created by our community, ranging from hobbyists who are just starting out or learning to code to large teams that can have 30, 40, 50 people. We're, va we're soon approaching the time when one of the teams on Roblox is going to make $100 million a year. And, and some of the most creative people in the world are, are working on the platform I personally have an affinity for railroad simulation type experiences. There's a lot on the platform, but pretty much anything we could imagine, we'll probably find some experience like that on Roblox. Well, speaking of kids, I, yeah, I'm a parent, and even though you've got these parental control, controls, I still worry. I still worry, are my kids safe? Are they developing healthy habits? Are they engaging with Roblox and this technology you know, in a healthy way? What advice do you have for parents and people like me out there who are still trying to understand how we should moderate our children's experiences? Yeah, I think this is, is twofold. We're, we're being very, very thoughtful in that we're, we're very optimistic over time more and more as people that come together on platforms like Roblox will be helping uh, with civility and will be giving nudges and hints to actually, we like to make the world a better place through that. For parents, uh, please talk to your kids. There's, this is always a discussion that you can use Roblox and other forms of media to have a, a great discussion about this. So we, we always recommend close communication. Thank you for that advice. Roblox co-founder and CV CEO, David Bazuki. great to have you back with us. Appreciate it. <laughs> and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology, you can make sure you tune in tomorrow. We're going to have my exclusive interview with Adam Solipsky, the CEO of Amazon Web Services, and Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Alphabet and Google. Just another day here on Bloomberg Tech. You don't want to miss. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.